The Crit Show contains elements of horror, fantasy violence, and adult language. Content warnings can be found in the episode description. So I'm really nervous to be here today because of a oh. dream I had. Uh-oh. Oh. I had this dream that we arrived and Rev was already here and Kim was on screen already. And we walk in and it's sort of awkward because when we come in on the right side as, as we're making our way to our seats, it's you know just the wall where Megan sits. But we couldn't really get around very easily because all of our lockers had been pulled out along that wall. So it was really hard to traverse and we're like okay good good gag rev and like jake starts to pull the lockers back and this curtain behind us that muffles sound was closed and immediately rev is on his feet and says no do not take those back there do not pull that curtain and we're like whoa okay buddy and he was serious like it was that tone of like don't like we are we're not joking here anymore there's nothing that's a joke with this and we're just terrified so we like shuffle through and have to like squeeze past the lockers to get to our seats and you know we put on our headphones and even Kim's like I don't know I don't know what's going on I I didn't see what was going on before the camera came on and we're like okay okay we're well, no worries we're good everything's fine here and Rev calmed down and just sat down like you know nothing was an issue and we're like okay so the whole I don't know what we were talking about or recording but I just kept like glancing down towards the corner like just looking at this curtain trying to get an angle and like see if I could notice anything weird and I just sort of let that fade for a while because I was like okay I don't know what that was about that was super strange but then at some point during the recording I feel something caress the back of my neck (laughs) (laughs) and I just look back just quick enough just to see that the curtain is sort of retreating from whatever was there had pushed it to touch me and I I think I just died. I think I just died of fright because that's the last thing I remember yeah. in that dream. So I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for yeah. it today. Boy, you have set yourself up for so many pranks. We're going to come in here next week. The, <laughs> the lockers will be pulled yeah. back. I just saw Jake reach for the back of your neck just yep. now. Yeah. So. yeah, it's already started. What do you think is what do you think is our real world reaction if we came in and like Rev was like, don't look behind that curtain. Each of us individually walked in to... Rev telling us not to open the curtain and Kim being like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. What would each of the three of us do? I think Jake would instantly walk back. Be like, what the fuck's going on? And I think like, there's and open open. the curtain. I think there's yeah. a good chance. I'll tell you what I wouldn't fucking do is sit in the chair with my back to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like if he was obviously not, there was no joke to this and he was deadly serious. Yeah. I would not open the curtain. But I would not move until he told me why. Yeah, Yeah, insist on an explanation. Like, this sounds like a great, weird indie horror movie. Right. Where I'm just like, sit down, just quickly sit down. (laughs) Like, just one one location, like... Yeah, and, and like, as we see, like... Tass reacts to something touching his neck and he like looks at me and I just slowly shake my head no. <laughs> don't do it, don't do it. Don't turn but around. Don't, don't that, react. that implies that I would have seen what was touching Tass's neck and I just didn't say anything about it. She's in on it. <laughs> <laughs> You're assuming that it's visible. Oh. Mm, that is true. Oh. Or she's she's like, sorry, the camera froze for a second. Oh what, no. What happened? Oh. Why is the camera all fuzzy? But Tass sits directly across from Kim's camera so something could touch the back of his neck and she could not it's see it. It sneaks underneath and just right up behind uh, him. Yeah. Like, uh, and like in that moment, tentacle. like as Tass looks at me and I'm shaking my head no, he like pans over and we see Megan who's just staring behind him and she's just <laughs> like gaunt <laughs> white. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So that's our next uh, tier. Where Let's we're get a treatment make that written movie. up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, roll out the whiteboard. Let's start yeah. breaking these down. Yeah. Start storyboarding. <laughs> I love it. Maybe we can make that um, the escape room that we create at Gen Con. Yes. Okay. <laughs> what was the name of that group that we did the thing with at Gen Con? Chicago Con LARP. Okay. I couldn't remember, but I want to do it again. Oh, absolutely. We got it. We had we the best time. Yeah. I had way more fun at that than I remotely had at True Dungeon. Oh, Ooh, yeah, yeah. We're, co- we're coming for True Dungeon Light right now. Light these motherfuckers up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to wear appropriate footwear. Fair. 
I'm going to multi-class <laughs> so nice. I can do something except hide under tables. Yeah. <laughs> you you did that so well, though. <laughs> I was literally just telling the story yesterday of you sneaking over to the gold and clanking it into your bag while everyone else was trying to convince the thieves to join us because of our 401k program. <laughs> <laughs> I was playing a healer, but I made a pretty good rogue. Yeah. Um, we have got our event submitted for Gen Con. Uh, we are going to do the same thing we did last year. One game session each day, six GMs, so 30 seats. So in total, uh, 120 folks will run through Monster of the Week. So uh, get your badges, and then you'll be signed up on their email list to know when all of the events go live. Uh, with that, it's time to get into the episode. You're all standing on the deck of the IPT cruise. You're disoriented from your trip through the portal. The sun is bright in the sky, blurring your vision. And each of you have images burned into your mind of your transformation as you had come through the portal. Megan, what you had felt almost more than seen is this idea of some of your magic that's attached to being the empath seeming to fold in on itself and separate from you. The image that you have are these bright glowing hands holding out a book as you take it. And in your hands here on the deck are books and supplies that you know contain a portion of that magic. Kim, the images burned into your brain seem to call back to your ability to see across worlds and communicate with other versions of yourself. There's this ping that you felt, this confusion almost, that you exist in this place. And as you came through, you saw images of these humanoid forms covered in scales, iridescent colors, and brightly colored hair. A name springs to your mind as this image of this large, muscular man with this iridescent, scaled skin seems to be shouting at you in panic. His name is Dorva. There's a feeling of terror all around you, of battle. But that fades away as you also regain your consciousness here on the deck. Landara, it feels more like remembering a dream. But as you traveled to this place, you're no stranger to hopping into new versions of reality, but something stopped you. This memory that you have is of a massive form in darkness. The form itself is a huge human skull. 30 feet tall, with fanged teeth. There's a swirling darkness in its eyes, and from behind it, massive tentacles made of bone stretch up and around. As you take in the details, the tentacles seem to be made of entire human skeletons clinging together and lashing from behind and underneath this massive skull. Behind even this imposing form is a huge door and darkness all around it. You hear a voice whisper to you, you've, you've been, been touched, touched by, by death in, in many, many worlds, worlds. And, and so, so you, are you are touched here. here. I, I send, send you to bring, bring me what I need. Find Esten and kill him. him. And then your vision clears as you're here on the deck. Jake, as you are driving through, it seemed kind of whimsical and fun that the little toy monkey that you had hanging from the rearview mirror like its eyes seem to catch you, like you just can't, doesn't matter how you shift, it just seems like it's looking right at you. And that was kind of neat. <laughs> the ship that you're all standing on, as you're able to finally see clearly, is an odd color. The wood seems to have that shifting blue to green to purple of the IPT cruiser. The ship has two masts, it has two cannons, one on either side, starboard and port, and the only feature that you all can see on this massive ocean is a ship on the horizon with large, dark purple sails heading your direction. Tell me, what all are we looking at as you look at each other? I'm wearing black boots, black leather pants, a white poet shirt tucked into those pants that features a dangerously deep V and a one shoulder cavalier cape that is embroidered with iridescent beetle shells. And around my hip is a 
very impressive looking silver rapier. My clothing is a little more worn. I am wearing a T-length silver skirt uh, that's kind of tattered at the end, and I'm not wearing any shoes. I have a white uh, loose-fitting blouse and a choker that has a image of a hummingbird on a medallion in the middle. And then I have a hooded capelet that is kind of tattered at the ends as well, but it's the exact same blue shade of my hair. Across my shoulder, I have like a satchel that is filled with inks and paints and paper and some other supplies. Uh, and then around my waist and kind of secured on the other hip is a book holster that's holding two books. Landara didn't really have much sense of what this was like. There was not really a prep course. And so she was just thinking about being herself when she came through. And she is dressed in dark brown boots and black pants. She has a long black duelist's coat with a strap across the chest that holds a rifle to her back. And at her hip are two pistols. Her guns, both the pistols and the rifle, are slightly odd looking because they are made of bone and bronze. And the pockmarks inside of the bone on the rifle are filled with blood. And I think the other noticeable thing is that her clothing, even though she has just stepped into this world, is already blood-stained, both with what seems like some very old and some very new splatters of blood. And you also see a three-foot-tall red howler monkey <laughs> dressed in garish and faded fancy lad clothes <laughs> <laughs> that opens its mouth and says, guys, I think I fucked up. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, to Rapscallion. We are playing this wonderful pirate game uh, in the Powered by the Apocalypse system from Magpie Games. At the time of this recording, Rapscallion is in Ashcan release. There is an Ashcan version, but they are much further along in the process than that. The game is very, very different than the Ashcan that you can find. They were kind enough to let us use the updated version of what they're working on. It is leaps and bounds past the Ashcan version. And uh, we're actually very well versed in this game because we've been using it pretty much since the Ashcan on our Patreon game, Perilous Tides. Uh, so we have seen all of the updates and new versions, new playbooks, uh, deletions of playbooks and rules, all sorts of uh, really fun updates to get to where they are now. Yeah, and per our understanding, at least... How it stands at this moment, I think what we are playing right now is the quick start version that should be released relatively soon. Yeah, so keep your eye out for that. So let's go ahead and talk about these playbooks. I am playing the Swashbuckler. My oddity is Star Touched. You've been Star Touched. Where did it touch you and what mark did it leave? I think in this world, my eyes just faintly glow all the time like it does when I have a vision. At the beginning of every session, mark one luck. When you are truly lost and don't know which way to turn, look to the stars and roll plus Spitfire. On a hit, the stars will tell you where to go. On a seven to nine, the destination they send you to is dangerous, strange, or seemingly nonsensical. On a miss, they will tell you something true, but you will not want to hear it. My stats are one blood minus two vinegar. <laughs> One polish and one spitfire. So talking about those real quick, we'll kind of go over this for anyone new to Rapscallion. Blood is the stat for fighting. Vinegar is kind of your... Your moxie. Yeah, your moxie. You're, you're able to trick people, things like that. Uh, polish is more for charm. And spitfire is the answer to magic in this world. I have eight health and the capacity for five points of luck. Uh, I possess a signature weapon, which is my silver rapier, uh, which is to harm close and has the additional tags strange and stun. So uh, strange is kind of the magic tag in this game. It allows me to use it as a locus to perform rituals and as a weapon with the strange tag. It will ignore armor that does not have the strange tag. And stun, I can spend a bond with my target to give them the stunned tag where they are frozen in place for a few seconds. And the rest of my kit is a ludicrously fancy cloak, a musical instrument 
a collection of letters from secret admirers and old flames. I have to imagine that in the like couple of weeks that I've been in this world, I've tried to get onto various dating apps. And so <laughs> this collection of old of of let of letters from old flames and secret admirers is just like written out text message conversations with people that I met on like Hinge. You up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. A whole parchment <laughs> just, with a whole bunch of them that uh, just say you up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of them are not very enlightening. <laughs> um, <laughs> pressed flowers, beautiful tawdry jewelry, a makeup kit, a small book of poetry written by a chronicler, which has the tag dangerous and to treasure. I'm playing the chronicler and... The oddity I chose is called Fox-Eyed. You're the most dangerous of chroniclers, a poet. (laughs) You may spend one luck to see the secret thoughts and feelings of the people around you. If you are surrounded by strangers when you do this, you are overwhelmed with these hallucinations and are compelled to react to those hallucinations in a dangerous or foolish way. Uh, My stats are zero blood, plus one vinegar, negative one polish, and plus one spitfire. Uh, I have the capacity to take six points of harm and up to five luck. Uh, For my kit, I possess one book I've already written. Uh, So with this playbook, your power comes from books that you have. You read them and they are able to uh, let you do things. And some people, like Kim had mentioned, she has a poetry book written by a chronicler. Uh, But if you are not a chronicler, it's a little more dangerous to use it. Or if it was written by a different chronicler, it's dangerous to use it. Uh, So the book that I have that I've already written is a small book called A Pinch of Salt and Other Superstitions. Love it. Mm. And the ability this book can do is the reader can cause mishaps to befall a target. Uh, Books have conditions under which you can use them. And this one is that you must invoke knowledge about the target. So the more intimate the knowledge is, the more devastating the mishap can be. Mm. Uh, And then in my little satchel, I have... Uh, paint sets and bottles of ink, collections of paper and parchment, half discarded love poetry, <laughs> which <laughs> I think is excellent because I picked this oddity because I think it made most sense, you know, with being an empath and coming in and kind of really focusing on that as I shifted into this world. But I'm not a poet. <laughs> I'm not a writer. So I imagine I tried and I was like, mm, nope, this one's not. Hmm. I can't I can't send this text to Damien. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These deleted like, text. D is for, no. Um. <laughs> Save that one for later. Uh, a tattered colorful cloak. So that's the one I think it would be neat to just have it blend in with my natural hair color and it could almost seem like my hair is longer if I needed it to. It's still very obvious because it's blue, but Uh, I like it. (laughs) And three small vials of spice and sugar and one treasure. Lovely. What are spice and sugar? Well, you see, when you're preparing food, (laughs) you can... (laughs) I'm sorry. Yeah, it doesn't like really go into it in this. It just kind of gives you tags for it. It's very much more like drug kind of analogous yes yeah oh. there there are portions in this that speak to some of the character types like going after the spice and partaking of this and that so there there are oh gotcha little nods in there to that without it being explicitly explained okay so the tags for this are spice edible slow causes spice eater trouble which is one of the dangerous tags that you might have complications from and the sugar one is edible slow causes sugar skin to trouble but those honestly were just part of this kit that i liked the rest of it more than the other options so i'm mostly just imagining it as like i wanted to eat better in this world because the last one (laughs) the one the last one we went to we just had weird protein bars that jake loved that (laughs) i really really didn't like seasoning yeah i wanted to make sure i had some uh some flavorings to go in whatever we ate here so i'm translating that Literally into spice and sugars. <laughs> I love nice. that. So Landara is the gunslinger. My oddity is death's chosen. You have an accord with death. Every downtime, death will provide you with a name. If you don't already have one, you are compelled to kill that person. If you do, death will give you one of the following boons. Learn dark knowledge. Receive a dubious gift. Clear all black marks. My stats are plus one blood, zero vinegar, minus one polish, and plus one spitfire. I have eight points of health and five points of luck. As I mentioned in her description, I have a bloodstained gun, which is to harm, far, loud, cursed, reload to, uh, and I get to pick two tags, and I have taken 
spray and piercing, uh, which lets it bypass armor and uh, hit an area. And then my kit, there are a couple of kits to pick from, which gives you your additional gear. Mine is two jury-rigged pistols, thieves' tools, a self-made gun repair kit, several kegs worth of gunpowder, bags of sand, a tonic, an explosive, matches, and a few bottles of whiskey. I am playing the ship rat. Uh, my oddity is monkey. <laughs> Go on. You're a pretty smart monkey. Aww, <laughs> you are. Not, not even a very smart monkey. <laughs> You're a pretty smart monkey. You have two of the following, your choice. I went with the ability to talk. Good call. And a prehensile <laughs> tail that can wield weapons. Yes. You can always <laughs> climb dangerous things and fit in improbably tiny spaces no matter what. How big a monkey are we talking? I am a howler monkey. Uh, there are different kinds of howler monkeys, I think, but I am like roughly three feet tall. Oh, you're so cute. I just looked up. The kind of monkey that you are. Yeah, the little red ones are adorable. Mm. So yeah, you're really cute. cute. Um, I mean, you're always cute, Jake. But especially as a oh, monkey. Oh, thank you. My stats are plus one blood, plus one vinegar, minus one polish, and zero spitfire. Uh, I have a total of six health and five luck. And my kit includes three tasseled devil sticks, which count as clubs as far as weapons go, <laughs> thin-soled shoes, a colorful hand-me-down cloak. A decorated mask, animalistic, operatic, or plain. I'm going with operatic. It looks like a little boy. Like it, It's like a weird artistic opera mask rendition of like a little boy's face. A human boy, to be clear. Oh, I see. So a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> uh, long rope, a faded cloak, a fancy ring of royal birthright or past allegiance. Oh well, I, are you the king of the monkeys here? The monkey prince. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't decided what the, which one of those it is. Ah, um, uh, that's totally the the ring that's like on the string on the back of the monkey hanging from the <laughs> that you pull to yeah. make it oh, scream. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Is this going to turn into Return to Monkey Island so Jake can claim the throne? <laughs> I'm just now imagining like the horror movie application of this of just like f from out of an impossibly tiny space <laughs> scrabbles a three foot tall. Fancy boy wearing like a porcelain <laughs> doll mask and a cloak. I think that horror movie came out a couple years ago, actually. <laughs> I'm gonna say this thing is of royal birthright. I don't think it's <laughs> mine, but I could be proven wrong. I don't know. Uh, and an unopened cask of deep whiskey, which counts for <laughs> one treasure. So we've thrown around a few terms here, and of course. When they become majorly applicable, we will talk over them in a little more detail. Um, like, just there are lots of little fun things in this. Like, everybody has a slightly different health track and um, your luck capacity. Luck is different in this than Monster of the Week in that it is a kind of a currency that you can earn and spend. Um, so it ebbs and flows through lots of different mechanics. Um, even just by doing something cool, you can be awarded luck uh, to then spend to have certain effects. A lot of this stuff is also going to be tied to some of the questions and moves. So let's let's jump down to like the questions and lead into yeah how how those relate to what you've built and uh, maybe even some of the vices and things. We'll explain those in a little more detail. All right, my first question is: You have a dark past. What happened? What do you need to do to redeem yourself? Um, Tass knows. I do. Tass knows this. Um, I'm not going to say it out loud right now because I'll explain in a second why. Um, <laughs> you tease. I know, right? Question number two. You seek vengeance on an important member of a faction. Which faction and why? Boy, I came through and they told me Eston and I know that motherfucker's name. Um, so it is definitely, uh, you know, Nash and, and this group. Landara doesn't necessarily have a personal connection to this fight, but having spent so much time with Rev and having met TJ, seeing the ramification he is having on people's lives, the things that he has done to the people who are now her friends, she has taken it personally. Sure. One of your crewmates is connected with an enemy, uh, is your only remaining family, has blackmail over you. They gain plus one bond with you. It's Megan. She has blackmail over me, and that blackmail is the thing that happened. Uh, what is it in Landara's past that has happened? Something that Landara is very ashamed of, and I believe that is the piece of information that Megan knows about. I do like that. I like the thought that Megan's powers, like kind of lashing out and around and reforming, 
pulled this information from, you know, the person here that arguably she doesn't know as much. Yeah, I mean, my oddity is that I can spend luck to see the secret thoughts and feelings of the people around you. So I think it makes sense that while that is something I will actively choose to do later in becoming an ability in this world, it kind of activated as it settled in me and I was able to pull that from you. So the story that Landara told the boys when they were in Dungeon World was that she died and then she was recruited by death, given the opportunity to come back. Um, The truth is that she was sacrificed by a group of people who were trying to make contact with death and she proposed the bargain with death so that she could get revenge on them. Brutal. She was not conscripted. Yes, she offered. And then number four, you begin uh, with two bonds with your crewmates. Who do you have bond with? One of them has to be Jake because I know him best. I think that that's just instinctual. Like, it's not even a choice. I think in this moment, if I know coming through this world somehow instinctively that Megan knows my secret, I think it's Kim. I think my other bond goes to Kim. So my questions, my first one, you have a soulmate. The most important person in your life, who is it? Decide whether they're your rival, love interest, or comrade. (laughs) Oh my, who who are you? I'm about to make everyone at this table very uncomfortable. (laughs) Megan, would you like to be my soulmate? Sure, man. (laughs) She said yes. Uh, (laughs) No. Finally, I pull out an engagement ring. She said sure, man. (laughs) (laughs) Which she should. She says sure, man. For Megan, that's a yes. (laughs) Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, Megan is my comrade. So, Megan, take one bond with me. Done and done. Boy, everybody feeding Megan bonds. <laughs> nom, nom, nom. And we'll get into what my, because uh, uh, Megan being my soulmate has a move attached to it, but we'll get into uh, what that is later. Uh, my next question, you possess a signature weapon, which is my silver rapier. What's strange about it? Do you know where it comes from? Um, I mean, that's... Pretty self-explanatory. What's strange about it is it is a magical weapon from another world. Uh, And yes, of course I know where it came from because it's what my silver sensor turned into. Nice. You have a sordid history with someone important from a faction. Who is it? What's the terrible secret they'd kill to protect? So I believe this is tied in with the vision that I saw when I came here. So I know that this is someone named Dorva. Right. So absolutely, I think this innate knowledge that you get is that there is another version of you here and you were able to connect in this moment of coming through and this other version of you is known as a seaborn, that they are this aquatic race that has this whole kingdom. There's not a lot of those details like, you know, you didn't get to see into very much because... It was a very intense moment that you connected to specifically. And that moment was that Dorva, this military leader of the Seaborn, just betrayed a group of his soldiers, including the other version of you, as some sort of sacrifice to save the rest of the kingdom. That he brought them to a place to fight this horrific creature under the guise of, I know how to beat it, when in reality, he knew you all wouldn't. He knew that many, if not all of you, would die, but it would give the rest of the kingdom time to act in some way. That's really cold, Dorva. So when you say there is another version of Kim in this world... You mean there was. Was? At the moment that you all came through, this was a living person that you were connecting to in real time, and that is all you know. Ah. Ooh. Uh, My last question, you begin with three bonds to allocate to your crewmates. Who do you have bonds with? Uh, So I have a bond with uh, Jake, of course. And Rev, I'm sorry, I just don't know Landara that well. So I think my other two bond are going to go to Megan. That makes sense. We've never talked. No, literally (laughs) never. Uh, For my questions... I have, you specialize in histories, fantasies, or poetry. Uh, I went with poetry, which is whose important secret do you know? That would be Landara's. In addition to your kit, you have your magnum opus, only half written. Completing it will take a great deal of power. What do you need to finish it? What can it do when it's done? Uh, So that kind of ties into one of my moves as well. In in this game, as the chronicler, you have to spend what are called downtimes to write books uh, to be able to use without them being dangerous. Uh, So this one is 
kind of half written. I have an idea of what it's going to be, uh, but I think I'll elaborate on that if we get to a point where we take a downtime and I have the time to to write it. Uh, next is, you put your hopes not in people, but into books. Why or what do you wish to escape? And I think with this, the way I'm imagining it is it's not so much that my hope is not in people, but I think right now it's a little less in people uh, just from having gone to the future and having to lead a resistance of people who are being hunted because they weren't magical and then coming back to our reality and seeing humans just murdering people who were inhuman. And it's kind of taking a toll on me in the sense of not being able to trust that people want each other's best interests at heart. Uh, so right now I am putting more of my hopes into books in the sense of this this iPad that Sherry gave us, you know, this this manuscript on how we can build a future. I'm I'm focusing on this writing and looking to it and looking to it to guide me to helping everyone. Uh, so it's what are you trying to escape? It's I'm trying to escape people's self interest and focusing on a way to bring everyone together with a plan. And right now that's through writing. Uh, and then I began with one bond to allocate to a crewmate. Who do you have a bond with? Honestly, I have to give it to Jake. I think coming through and seeing him being an animal, there's no way <laughs> <laughs> that I'm not just instantly like, well, now I'm going to extra try to keep you alive because I don't want anything to happen to a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then I will have the bond with Kim from being her soulmate and the bond with Landara from knowing her secret. Uh, my questions. Number one. You're the lowest on this ship's pecking order. Which crewmate pushes you around? Oh, my God. Uh, I'm going with Landara. Um, <laughs> there's going to be sort of a running theme revolving around Landara here. But basically, since Landara's like the most no-nonsense of any of us, uh, I feel like if I try to bullshit around, Landara is the one who's like, stop it. And I feel like there's some level of her not understanding that you're full brain jake in there <laughs> you know what i mean like she might this, just think like uh. it's been a while since we spent time together and she's like this is certainly the monkey brain part right yeah <laughs> because you were so serious when you guys were together <laughs> and now she's like what this is a monkey man this is not or jake this is not the man i, I have to keep him <laughs> in, in line yeah number two your family disowned you went missing or are long dead um i chose went missing uh and then it asks under what mysterious circumstances um so i'm applying this to tass oh that's me uh, tass has been frozen mm. under mysterious circumstances and part of the objective here is to figure out what and fix it before we go back number three you just stole something legendary and worth a fortune it's part of your kit what is it which faction desperately wants it which of your crewmates know uh, this is the magical blueprints that we just stole from the <laughs> space base, mm. from the nice. clone base. Well, that wrapped itself up nicely. Yeah. So which faction desperately wants it? Presumably Nash's faction. Really, probably a lot of them would be real hungry to get their hands on this. Which of your crewmates know? They all know that, that I have this. I guess Landara might not explicitly know, but it's not like a secret. Yeah. Uh, and lastly, you begin with two bonds to allocate to your crewmates. Who do you have bonds with? I'm going to put both of my bonds with Landara. And again, this is related to some moves I'll talk about in a second, but overall, I'm just sort of fixated on how is Landara going to gel with this crew um, because it's just me and people she hasn't worked with before and she's a much higher level operator than us in a lot of ways. So I'm just kind of like fixated on how's this going to go? What's the nature of our relationship going to be like here? And, you know, we all have been working together one way or another. Um, you know, even... Landara, who, you know, some of you literally haven't even necessarily spoken to out loud, uh, <laughs> but y'all are a team. Go ahead and take two more bond that you can apply wherever you want to apply it. All right. You know, I came through here to take Tess's place to help protect everybody. Um, so with the two that I had and then these two in toto, uh, I'm going to have one with Megan, one with Kim, and then two with Jake. Nice. Uh, I'm going to add another bond with Jake, bringing him up to two. And you know what, Landora? I'm going to take a bond with you. Hey. I think having two extra points, it's got to go with the other people I know best. So two with Kim, two with Jake, and one with Landara. Nice. Uh, I will add these one to Megan and one to Kim. So uh, another thing on this, aside from your actual health track, there's kind of another version of health 
that you could be dealing with at the same time. Uh, in a way, it's similar to stress in Starhold, um, but this could also lead to you, you know, going done for and, and being out of the game for a little bit or entirely if you fill this track as well. And they are called troubles. So everybody has, in theory, four slots, I believe, for their troubles. And these are general things that you could get that are just something that's affecting you negatively as you go on. If you get one of these, there's also going to be a clear condition for it for you to be able to get rid of it. Uh, an example is a migraine. If you have this horrible headache, you mark this down, and if a loud noise happens, I can compel you to pass out right there on the spot. That's something you can try to stand against, but it's just a problem in the way. But a clear condition for that might be to take several days of complete rest and you get rid of that. So then you can get rid of that trouble and it's not bringing you down anymore. If you fill that track, bad things happen. Also, most, not all, but most of you have what's called a vice as well, and that's fairly specific to each of the playbooks in that it is a trouble that might pop up more for each of you. Sometimes it may not even pop up as a trouble on your track, but just something going on that I can use for compulsions or other um, fail results, things like that. So those that have them, let's go ahead and talk about your vices. And can you explain real quick, you you have said, we've all said a couple times, you know, we're compelled to do something or we can stand against it. What do those two things mean? That is a great question. So there is a move in this called Stand Your Ground. Again, once that pops up, we'll kind of go in for the nitty gritty of, of how each of the moves work. But Stand Your Ground is essentially there to stop any compulsion that I give you. So again, compulsions can pop up for fail results or mixed results, or even often uh, they could be tied to some of your moves or, or some of your uh, playbook features. Uh, so that's just like a very simple example is maybe your character is a thief and they're walking by and there's somebody's just wallet sitting up on a counter. I might go, man, that's a golden opportunity for me to compel you to try to steal that. And so you can either just do it yep, or you can try to stand against that that desire, that urge, that compulsion to do it. Exactly. Okay. You can roll the stand your ground move and hopefully get past that. And if not, then, you know, bad things happen. If not, then you got to do it anyway. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, mine is bloodthirsty. And the clear condition is choose not to take vengeance. You are compelled to see anyone between you and your goal as mere obstacles easily put down. When you kill someone innocent for the sake of vengeance, mark one experience. Damn. Oh, no. Wow. Brutal. Yeah. My vice is restless, and the clear condition is resist a great temptation to stray. While restless, you can be compelled by the fates to change your soulmate to a new target of your affections. If your former soulmate is jilted, lose one bond with them. If you give in willingly, mark one experience and gain one bond with the new soulmate. Tell them an emotion they experience when they next see you. Choose whether your new soulmate is your rival, love interest, or comrade. My vice is called book fever. The clear condition is face headlong something that scares you. When in book fever, you can be compelled by the fates to retreat into your books instead of facing your problems. When you willingly abandon a crewmate in doing so, mark one experience and gain one bond with the book you've retreated to. This book begins to manifest a will of its own, and a powerful genie rises from its pages that cannot stray far from its book. You may spend one bond with this genie to use the book's powers freely, without rolling, conditions, or consequences. If you wish to use the book otherwise, you must parlay with the genie instead of unleashing its power. My vice is envious, uh, cleared by resisting out of compassion. While envious, the fates may compel you to sabotage your mark to get what you want. If you succeed, mark one experience. Okay, so last but not least, let's talk about what moves you all either get automatically and or took. All right, so both of my moves I get automatically. The first is the black mark. When you use vengeance to fuel you into action, choose an effect and roll plus blood. On a hit, it happens. On a 7 to 9, the thing in parentheses happens too. Uh, and the things I can choose are shoot to thrill, take a black mark to hit your next target, dead in the chest for plus 3 harm, forceful piercing, but your weapon's curse will take effect, which is what's in uh, parentheses, bad to the bone, take a black mark to make someone small do whatever you want by threatening violence. And in parentheses, you're compelled to do the violence anyway. <laughs> and then jumping jack flash, 
Uh, take a black mark to escape your current perilous situation, even if it seems impossible. And then the parentheses is, but mark bloodthirsty. And so all of that says, take a black mark, take a black mark. I also have a black mark tally. I can have up to six black marks. When I fill my tally, I choose an enemy I've made. They show up right there, right then. <laughs> and then my other move is called shot. When you get into a scrap, you can make a called shot. If you hit, take the ante and choose a tag from the following options. Your target takes that tag in addition to the harm. On a 7 to 9, take a vice or a black mark, your choice. Uh, and the tags I can give them are blind, they can't see anything, crippled, they buckle, one leg busted, they can't run, only limp slowly, maimed, they drop their holding and can't use that arm, rattled, they get sloppy, and you take a plus one ongoing on moves against them. And then all of my level ups are just additional picks for my first move, the black mark. So I have two moves that this playbook always starts with. The first one is theatrics. I love this move. When you enter a fight, roll plus polish. On a hit, take one hold. On a 10 plus, take an additional hold. Spend hold to mark one of the following theatrics and use its effect immediately. You can't use an option that's already been marked. When all the theatrics have been marked, erase the marks and start over. And these are the options I have to choose from. Swing from something and land exactly where you need to be. Pin an enemy to the wall by throwing something. Challenge someone to a duel that they can't refuse. Disarm a mook with a single flick of the hand. Or reveal that, despite everything, you have yet another weapon up your sleeve. <laughs> so you have to do all of those. Before I can repeat one. That's amazing. On a miss, describe how your entry into the fight is embarrassing. The fates pick a witness who isn't impressed. <laughs> <laughs> if it's your soulmate, lose all all bond with them. Oh, <laughs> oh! If it's not, take restless. Oh, brutal. Okay. And my next one is soulmate. You have a soulmate. Hi, Megan. Hi. If your soulmate is a rival, spend one bond with them to compel them to duel, fight, or pay attention to you. If you ever thoroughly beat them, you're compelled to mark restless. If it's a love interest, spend one bond with them to be at their side in the nick of time whenever you sense they're in danger. If they ever seem infatuated with another, you're compelled to mark restless. Or a comrade, which I currently have, spend one bond with them while carousing and merrymaking with them to clear one of your troubles. If they ever call you out on your foolishness, you're compelled to mark restless. <laughs> so we just have to party for you to feel better? Yep. Excellent. But don't call me out on my foolish Yeah, the next morning you can't be like, do you remember that shit you did? Because then she'll be restless. <laughs> I have one move that this playbook starts with, and it's called Wordsmith. Uh, so this is kind of like the main focus of this playbook. Uh, it ties back to the books that I talked about in my kit and how I would use them. Uh, so when you write a book, use paper and ink during downtime, begin the work. Tell the fates what the book is about and what you want the book to do when you read it aloud. The fates give you a quest you must complete before you finish it, selecting from the following list. They may add up to four additional quests for more powerful and complex books. So the quest options are you must first experience blank, the book must be made from blank, the ink must be infused with blank, and blank must give the book their blank. Uh, so when you finish the book, roll plus Spitfire. On a hit, the book is exactly how you envisioned it. Pick one condition from the list and the fates fill in the blanks. This condition is known only by you and must happen before the book can be used. On a 7 to 9, pick an additional condition or the book is dangerous. Your choice. On a miss, the book isn't what you intended it to be. Tell the fates what turned out wrong. The fates tell you what weird thing the book does now. Pick two conditions for it. It's dangerous. So the book can only be used blank. The book won't work if blank. To read it, you must first blank. And reading it causes blank to blank. To use a book, fulfill its conditions, read it aloud, and unleash your power. You can use other chroniclers' books if you know their conditions, but they are always dangerous. So unleash a mysterious power is one of the main moves in the game. So that is just kind of what I have to use to make the book do its ability. Uh, so this is what I'll use for my A Pinch of Salt and Other Superstitions book uh, if I want to be able to cause mishaps to happen to people. Um, and then with my magnum opus that is half finished, this is kind of what I will 
be applying to that during a downtime. So it better be an epic love letter to Damien that, <laughs> that all the little texts just can't cover. Hmm. It's all the texts that I like thought I was deleting, but I was accidentally sending. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, and I have one more move that I got to pick. It's called Lore Keeper. When you encounter a new land, creature, or phenomenon, roll plus vinegar. On a hit, the fates will tell you a story about it. On a 10 plus, choose whether the story reveals something you can spin to your advantage, its hidden weakness, or the thing controlling or driving it. On a miss, the fates tell you a fanciful tale. The tale has a grain of truth to it. Take book fever to know what it is. The ship rat starts with one move by default and gets to choose another. So my default move is called Mutineer. At character creation, pick two of the following effects and pick a mark on your crew. You can spend one bond with them or take Envious to use the effects you picked. So the options are sneak up on them, sneak past them, or eavesdrop on them, know exactly what secret or weakness they're hiding, bait them and compel them to do something dumb in response, or stab them in the back for three harm and compel them what? to go done for immediately. <laughs> ah, God. Lord. Great. You may spend one bond with someone to make them your new mark. So you chose the stab one twice, right? Yeah. Yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah this playbook is definitely designed to be a real fucker to the rest of your crew. Mm. <laughs> um, Rapscallion so, as a whole is kind of a little more PvP uh, it is. than yeah. we normally play. So my mark is Landara. How dare you? Uh, <laughs> again, being the person that I'm kind of worried about how we're going to work together at this point and the person that I think I might have to do the most convincing towards to get her on board with stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so the options I've chosen are sneak up on them, sneak past them, or eavesdrop on them, and bait them and compel them to do something dumb in response. <laughs> ah, so not the backstab. Not the backstab. I imagine these both in, in a pretty non-aggressive use case. Just a, <laughs> a monkey hijinks case. Yeah, like just convincing Goofs. Landara to do something that she would consider reckless that I think is necessary to get the job done, or something yeah. like that. Uh, and then the move I've chosen is called Good for Thieving. When you squeeze into somewhere others can't, roll plus blood. On a hit, tell the fates where you get to. On a 10 plus, tell the fates if you want to find a secret that you didn't expect. On a miss, someone or something else is in there with you. Oh, God. <laughs> well, it can't be that threatening. It's in a little space. <laughs> Envision a howler monkey is threatening. <laughs> My... it's, it's a rat king. Oh, no. <gasps> yeah! I squeeze into a little space. There's another howler monkey that looks exactly like me. <laughs> but just, it's wearing a girl's mask instead of a little boy's mask. <laughs> we're just like, I raise my right hand as it raises its left hand. Like we're just reflections of each other. We take that one back through the portal yeah, with it, us. You guys switch places. Oh, we, no. You, uh, you trap. trap us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so a uh, few of you mentioned uh, as part of your moves down times. Uh, so that's another very important part of this game that generally pops up a lot. I, I imagine it will a couple of times uh, over the course of what we're doing as well, where essentially it is just a period of no real major action that gives you time to do other things. And there's a whole set of moves that are downtime moves um, where you can uh, accomplish stuff that isn't actively out, you know, on a sort of a, a mission or task. It's like a time passes. Yeah, it's usually at least a week or so. It could be longer, um, but but yeah, that's uh, something that we'll probably see. And lastly, before we jump into the action, uh, we'll talk over the ship playbook that you all took. There are a couple to choose from, and the one that we went with is called the Ramshackle, which I think is, like, come on, they, they did some good work on the IPT cruise. I yeah. think... Uh, it's a little less than ramshackle, but in, in one sense it is. Yeah, because... it's like a mix of magic and technology. Yeah. And... I mean, we took it to space and it got kind of beat up there. Yeah. It did. I just think James would be hurt to hear you call it that is all. <laughs> I think it's more representative of us as a crew. We are the ramshackle. <laughs> yeah. No captain, no navigator. <laughs> just a drift at sea. <laughs> yeah. Our driver turned into a monkey. <laughs> the team leader is a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't worry about it. Um, so it has an oddity that you all have chosen. There's a few to choose from, but what you picked was called It Came to You. This mysterious ship 
washed up on your shore when you needed it most. I mean, kinda. Like, when we needed something to be able to traverse these worlds, we came home and they said, it's done. We're like, okay. So that kind of fits. Yeah. Um, there are three choices here, but you only get to pick two. Um, so what this does for you. Uh, the first that you went with is called, That's What It Was Made To Do. When you scarper, which is uh, a ship move, you can always wash up on a place where someone desperately needs you instead of the other options. And also, it had a gift for you. The fates decide what special, precious thing is stowed away in the ship. It costs one cargo space. Yeah, that's right. I threw some stuff in the trunk. Don't you yeah. worry about it. And now he gets to choose what's in there. <laughs> Amazing. And it just makes sense that like, if we're steering the ship and things are going badly, we're here to to help these people, to help this world, to fix something, it makes sense that we wash up where someone needs help. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it has some questions as well that go along with it. Each crew member may name an essential change or addition they made to the ship. Everyone who does this gains one bond with the ship. Um, so yeah, what uh, little additions do we want to add here? I think rolling off of us having a med bay in Starhold, uh, we have a plentiful supply of healing salve on this ship. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, kind of a med bay area that is stocked. I like that. Yeah. I think that the ship has a smuggler's hold. Uh, I think that is something that in her travels has gotten Landara out of trouble. Uh, and so there's just a little spot where you can move some wood and there's a, a little area where you can stow some stuff away that doesn't look like it should open up. Love it. Going off of me bringing spices and sugars here, I want to make sure we're eating properly. So I think, you know, there's a there's a nice little galley, like an area for us to be able to make some decent food and stay on top of being being all fed and having nutrients and stuff. Not getting scurvy. It's so many oranges. Every cabinet you open it just attacked with limes. Wall to wall limes. <laughs> I am adding a crow's nest. Um one of the other ship oddities mentioned one that has like a mechanical benefit of some kind which implies to me that ours would not have it by default and i want it i liked when we initially talked about this off mic and jake was like i want a crow's nest because monkey want to be high <laughs> <laughs> and uh the ship has a kit as well this kit is a piecemeal ship it has one unit of cannons, a size two group of lackeys which we will get to uh handmade patchwork sails do we want that to be uh, attempting to look proper or like a rainbow of color? I feel like the rainbow of color makes more sense with an IPT cruiser as the base. Yes. yes. Rainbow okay. of color. Shifting hues. Love that. It has a cartoonish figurehead with a chipped paint job. Uh, it has suggestions, but I'm just going to make you pick one of these. A smiling lion, a leaping fish, or a dilapidated goose. Goose, <laughs> goose, goose, goose. It's goose, gotta goose. be goose in order of Tass's old job, yeah. Goose Palouse. Outstanding. <laughs> dilapidated goose it is. And I think a dilapidated goose looks most like the Chrysler symbol on the front of a PT Cruiser. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> I, I, I wings not, outstretched. I was not imagining this having wings. I was imagining it just the head, and it just kind of flopped over. <laughs> 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 dilapidated is such an, like... I don't know if that is referring to the condition of the figurehead or the like construction of the goose. <laughs> <laughs> the goose is tired. <laughs> Are you accidentally turning the IPT crews into the sea gobbler? <laughs> yeah, yes. kind of. No, okay. Uh, and flags adorning the rigging and a lifeboat. Oh. So the ships also have stats. Steadfast, speed, and fortune. Uh, your ship has plus one steadfast, zero speed, and minus two fortune. So for your context, the steadfast is the ship's toughness, how well it takes misfortune, whether it be the foul winds of a hurricane or dread cannons of the enemy. Give your ship a lot of steadfast if you want to sail into a fight fearlessly, cannons blazing, and live to tell the tale. Um, so this determines your wreck tally, which wreck is the, uh, the ship's health, and uh, how well it takes punishment. Speed is the ship's dexterousness, maneuverability, and, of course, speed. How well it outruns and outmaneuvers its peers. So you want a lot of that if you're wanting to get into more, um, you know, ship chases and things as opposed to just a fight directly. And fortune, the ship's size, wealth, and space. More fortune means more guns, more crew, more cargo. So... You have to raise that if you want, like, several decks of cannons, a big crew of lackeys to give you bonuses and so on. And the Ramshackles General Special is 
When the crew is in terrible danger and needs to scarper, you may spend a bond with your ship to escape from any situation at any time, no matter how unlikely it is or how wrecked you are. If you do, your ship washes up on pick one. A bustling, busy port, a sleepy harbor town, a mysterious, uncharted island, or what you all chose from your oddity, a place where someone desperately needs you. Lastly, of course, we're supposed to name the ship, but you know that that license plate that says IPT Cruise is now emblazoned along the hull. After taking each other in to see these, in some cases, wild changes to your forms. Jake, what the fuck? I don't know. You're adorable. I don't know. Oh, God. Oh, good. You can talk. Thank God. Well, it's got his voice. How do we know it's got his brain, his thoughts? Uh, uh. It's him. (laughs) (laughs) Does anyone know? This ship is so big. Does anyone know how to, like, how we steer it? How we do. Our driver's a monkey now. I've helped on a sailboat before. I don't think I've ever been on the ocean before. And as you're all taking each other in, it becomes evident to you all that there is a ship moving towards you on the horizon. Oh, God. Landara takes the rifle off of her back and peers through the scope towards the approaching ship. No problem. Uh, I think the first thing that is evident is that this ship absolutely dwarfs your ship. It is just lined with cannons, a couple of rows. It's a deep purple color. You see lots of movement on the deck, but you also see that the flag at the top of their mast is white. They're way bigger than us, and they got a whole lot more guns, but they're flying a white flag. That's peace, right? Or surrender? That means that they're not going to attack at the very least. Do we have anything on the ship that I could, like a, a white cloth, that I could climb up there and tie on for our flag? Yeah, absolutely. Then I'm just going to do that also as they're coming towards us. Like, I think in a panic, I want to make clear that we are not hostile. So I'll scramble up the rigging and tie on a white flag. No problem. And after a few more minutes, the ship is fully in view as it is uh, like slowing down and turning to kind of come broadside alongside you guys. Oh, no. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll walk up and I'm, I'm going to like sort of like rest a hand on my rapier. Like I'm trying to be like real casual about it, but like also just so I am have it close if anything bad happens. As it turns to the side, what's the name on the side of the ship? It's called the Desecration Smile. And the cannons are all pointed straight up. Oh, cool. Cool, cool, cool. And as it gets closer, there are three figures in particular that are standing uh, along the railing. One is raising a hand to wave at you. He is of medium height. He has long chestnut brown hair with a few streaks of silver through it. And the two beside him, Jake, you would kind of recognize. They, aside from their very piratey outfits and uh, scruffy beards, they look very much like Jeff and Eddie. <laughs> uh, I think my eyes kind of bug out, but I'm trying to play it monkey right now. I want to I wanna have a secret weapon, so I'm not revealing that I'm Ooh. not just a monkey. Is playing at monkey just sort of just like casually like eating a banana or what are you doing? Casually <laughs> leaning just against like the doorway eating a banana. <laughs> scratching my butt and smelling my hand. And... <laughs> What's the monkey stuff that you're doing though? <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, they they have slowed to a stop next to you and the figure with the long brown hair is giving you a sort of concerned smile. Uh he's looking over each of you and um He's even got a, just a small little white flag in his hand that he's waving. Is Landara the tallest of our crew? Well, now. <laughs> yeah. All right. Then I'm going to scramble up onto Landara's shoulder and just whisper in her ear, I know the two flunkies on the sides. They're cool. They're cool. I think we're good. You no, know, I'm like, actually know them? Well, not like these ones, but other ones. Oh, okay. Hello, travelers. Are you them? Are we who? And I think I'm just holding on to like the railing on the ship and trying to like steady myself as we're moving. Those that oppose Nash. Oh, yeah, we're them. Unless you're not, unless you don't oppose Nash. He smiles. I finger guns at Megan. Yes, that also. (laughs) (laughs) You're in good company, though. My vision seems to have been slightly wrong. You're missing the one with the golden aura. Yeah, there was uh, an accident right before we left. You probably didn't see me in your vision. I did not. Your aura is tinged with black and a splash of red. 
You may be as useful or more than the one with the gold. The one with that aura, something came through. Like when the portal opened, a bolt of energy came through. Froze him in place in time. You have any idea what that was? Oh, no, unfortunately, I don't know anything about that. We were quite a ways off, and so I saw quite a bit of magical energy from this direction, but no, I have no idea what could have done that. He wasn't frozen so much as really slowed down. I don't know if that helps any magic users who play with time in that way. Certainly not in my wheelhouse. Who are you? You can call me Cotton. I've been given a vision of you. I've come to lend aid. And as you're talking to him now that he's up close, you also notice that he has this shimmer of heat that seems to waft off of him at all times. May I come aboard? I look around at everyone else and just kind of shrug my shoulders. He nods to the other two who slide a plank over. And as Cotton starts to walk over, he glances down at the hull of your ship. What means this IPT cruise? It's a remnant of a foreign land. Ah, the world you're from? Yeah. How did you know we were going to be here? I have a particular brand of sorcery. I have visions. I was given a location, but it seems you're quite a few miles off from what I expected. My visions are not always complete or accurate. I don't feel too bad we actually left four or five minutes later than we had originally intended. Ah. Well, we have much to discuss. You have no reason to trust me, this I understand. My world is under attack from an old god, a malevolent force that's sweeping over the world. I've spent countless lives trying to reach across the veils of our worlds for assistance. Some have attempted help, some have answered. One such answer came in the form of Gregory Nash. He made a promise of power if we could swap energies. In a sense, he came here and asked for assistance in locating beings of great power. Of course, I am well versed in this, for I've been collecting them myself to assist in our battle. I helped him wrangle people, beings, into specific locations. There he set up magical forces with which to siphon these powers. Upon completion of the spell that he needed assistance with from me, He promised great power in fighting back this old god that plagues us. But some months ago, I discovered that he'd changed things. He is now strengthening the old god. The Crit Show is a Crit Show Studios production, edited and produced by Brandon Wentz, with music by Jake Purley. You can find more information about us at thecritshowpodcast.com. To keep up to date with upcoming live shows, contests, and other special events, follow us at The Crit Show on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For even more weekly content, join us at patreon.com slash thecritshow.